There's three things that I think about with Jared Goff. He's tough, he's durable, and most importantly, he's a winner. Turns out Dan Campbell wasn't just blowing smoke up our arses. Sometimes a label is slapped onto an athlete and no matter what they do after receiving that label, they're never allowed to shed it. A few examples include Barry Bonds, the only baseball player to never use steroids, Riley Cooper, civil rights activist, Miles Garrett, safe driver. Okay, maybe I have those backwards, but I'm thinking about a guy like Matthew Stafford, who even after winning a Super Bowl in LA last season, still isn't anything more than Stat Padford to many football fans. For Jared Goff, that label has been Sean McVay made him. He's nothing without Sean McVay. He's a tiny whiny baby bitch boy without McVay. Jared Goff's fiance is actually marrying him just to get closer to Sean McVay, we've heard it all. It's almost like he doesn't even get credit for throwing the football the entire season that took the Rams to Super Bowl 53. Well, Jared Goff is now having a hell of a season. And like Tua Tunga Vailoa, he started to play like a top 10 quarterback with top skill position players around him. Detroit has built their offensive line through the draft, found an absolute stud in the sun god Amon Ross St. Brown, and one of the most fun two-headed monsters to watch out of the backfield in DeAndre Swift and Jamal Williams. As it stands, Jared Goff is eighth in passing yards, completing 65.3% of his passes, has thrown 22 touchdowns to just seven picks and taken just 19 sacks this season. His 22 passing TDs is tied for fifth best, trailing Geno Smith, who has three more and just one more pick. If Geno Smith is getting unanimous praise, I think it's time to give Goff some as well. And I'm not even saying that the Lions can and will get to the postseason, but is Jared Goff playing as well as he did in 2018 when he had Sean McVay leading him and the team to the big game? Today, I want to talk about how it's no longer easy to beat Goff in Detroit. You get that rash thing here? I hate you. It's the Jared Goff episode. Please subscribe to this YouTube channel. Today's episode is sponsored by Audible and Alexa. Listening to Audible on Alexa. Audible and Alexa are together, like a celebrity cup couple, but but one that will stay together. Audible sponsored this show three years ago, and since then I've kept my subscription, listened to 73 audiobooks, and achieved 13 badges, including Night Owl, listening to book after book after book while dealing with the baby for the first time in two years in the middle of the night. And I've been listening to Audible on my Alexa when I exercise pretty much every day. These hands need to be free to build these guns. And Alexa allows me to do that. Alexa, read Fear the Wolf. Getting your selection from Audible, <clears throat> resume Fear the Wolf. A part of him wishes it were that simple. And right now, I suggest checking out Fear the Wolf by James Patterson. Alexa customers can just say, Alexa, read Fear the Wolf, and you can listen for free. It's labeled as a power family football thriller. Essentially, imagine if a certain owner of a team formerly with a very generic team name was a good guy. There's a bunch of free titles this month, so just use my link below to sign up. Unlike Tua, Jared Goff has never really been a polarizing figure at the QB position. And it's funny to even call Tua polarizing, considering he and Goff are both incredibly mild-mannered gents who I can't imagine rub very many people the wrong way. Goff hasn't been a polarizing player, but that's just because he's mostly been shit on as a player. <sighs> the Rams were good despite okay. Jared Goff. This guy fucking sucks, he's a bum. We want Blau, baby, we want Blau. And unlike Tua, he never really had a loyal fan base to defend him, a passionate fan base, the Rams arguably have one of the smallest fan bases in the NFL, and Lions fans are so used to being disappointed that they were certainly not going to light up Twitter and the chat boards defending Goff, who 
wasn't lighting up the scoreboard in Detroit as the team lost eight straight to start the 2021 season, Goff's first with the team. Even this season, Detroit lost five in a row, but their first four games were all high scoring affairs with all three games decided by three and four points. But let's go back to the start, Goff was the first overall draft pick in the 2016 NFL Draft after tossing 78 touchdowns in his last two seasons at Cal in Sonny Dyke's air raid offense. The same one that got TCU in the college football playoff this year. With that pedigree, we shouldn't be surprised that Goff is playing so well, but we are. Remember, the Rams traded up for the right to take Goff, swapping places with Tennessee, who had drafted Marcus Mariala a year earlier. Carson Wentz went number two overall to the Eagles, who had also traded up. And of course, Paxton Lynch was taken 26th in uh, one of the most underwhelming quarterback drafts in recent memory. And yet, both the Eagles and the Rams would cut a path to the Super Bowl in very different ways. Now, Jared Goff's greatest skill may be to not attract media attention. He's like a chameleon who learned how to be even more vanilla than Carson Wentz somehow. <laughs> the biggest scandal during Goff's rookie season was that he didn't know which way the sun rose and set on hard knocks. Remember, by year two, Carson Wentz was in the MVP conversation, leading it possibly before tearing his ACL, and Big Dick Nick came in to destroy Tom Brady in the Super Bowl for the Eagles. Goff, though, was quietly a Pro Bowl quarterback who led the Rams to the postseason only to lose to the Atlanta Falcons. Regardless, Goff was playing very well in his second NFL season, which I honestly forgot until writing this video. He was really grasping Sean McVay's offense and building a chemistry with a healthy running back, Todd Gurley, and some mid-round pick by the name of Cooper Cup. Goff went from a negative touchdown to interception ratio as a rookie to throwing four times as many touchdowns to picks in year two. That really underscores the difference between head coach Jeff Fisher a coach stuck in the early 2000s, and Sean McVay, a coach who was going through puberty in the early 2000s. But it's also a testament to Goff's ability to shake off a disastrous rookie season where he failed to win a game and come out clean on the other side. Something I think that ultimately prepared him very well to be a Detroit Lion. It was in year three that Goff became a legit MVP candidate, throwing for nearly 4,700 yards and 32 touchdowns as the Rams cruised through the regular season with a 13-3 record. And mind you, this was a Rams team that before 2017 hadn't made the playoffs since 2004. Now, Goff set a Thursday night football passing record with 465 yards and five touchdowns that season. And maybe his most memorable performance came against the actual 2018 MVP as the Rams and Goff outdueled Patrick Mahomes and the Chiefs in a 54-51 Monday night football matchup that's still regarded as one of the best regular season games of all time. Nearly 900 passing yards, 11 total touchdowns in that game, and we forget Jared Goff was slinging the rock in that one. It seemed like those two teams might be on a collision course for the Super Bowl. And in New Orleans, Goff became the youngest quarterback to ever win the NFC title game, but Tom Brady was gifted another Super Bowl appearance by a terrible roughing penalty and a D Ford lining up offsides. Now we all know the Rams lost Super Bowl 53 and it was mainly due to the fact that the Patriots defense played lights out. Sean McVay got outwitted by Bill Belichick. Jared Goff only completed 19 passes for 229 yards and a pick. Like Garoppolo missing Emmanuel Sanders after him, Goff is remembered for throwing this interception under duress to basically end the game. We forget, though, that uh, he dropped a dime to Brandon Cooks the play before that was well defended and ultimately not caught by Cooks. That's how the NFL works though, right? No excuses for the losers. Peyton Manning got the dub in Super Bowl 50 despite playing far worse uh, statistically speaking, than Goff. Hell, Bob Greasy, who was in the Hall of Fame, won a Super Bowl completing just six passes. Even though it ended with a thud in the Super Bowl, 2018 was, without question, Goff's best season as a pro. 
Or is it? Can we do it? Can we make the case that Jared Goff is playing better in 2022 than he was in 2018 when he went to the Pro Bowl and helped his team win 13 games? I'm gonna do it, so don't try and fucking stop me. Jared Goff has thrown 22 touchdowns through 13 games. That stat will change. Uh, we're gonna forget about that 17th game because there were only 16 regular season games in 2018 And if you do a little eighth grade math, you'll see that Goff is on pace for 27 touchdowns and 4,125 yards in a hypothetical 16 game season now those aren't quite up to his 2018 totals But it should be noted that Goff is throwing interceptions a half percent lower than in 2018 if the Lions threw the ball more inside the five-yard line, Goff would certainly have more touchdown passes. But why even risk it when you've got an elite goal line back in Jamal Williams, who has 12 rushing touchdowns of five or fewer yards? And I know all DeAndre Swift fantasy owners just clicked out of this video in a fitter age. Plus, uh, Dan Campbell is a football purist. And unlike Andy Reid, he's not going to conflate his quarterback's stats with a bunch of bullshit shovel passes that are essentially handoffs that count as passing touchdowns. Dan likes to keep his men humble, and it's working. Now, the Lions. This is a team that was a seller at the trade deadline, dealing away their starting tight end, TJ Hawkinson, who's still fifth in the team in targets despite being traded to the Vikings over six weeks ago. It's also a team that spent a first round pick on an injured wide receiver who made his first reception in week 14. For a touchdown, by the way, but I think that shows you the Lions weren't planning on necessarily being contenders this year. And yet, the Jared Goffins? has them in the thick of the NFC playoff race. Speaking of the Goffins, which has scored the fifth most points in the league, and that's counting a two week stretch where they put up a total of six points against Dallas and New England, they've had to shoulder the burden of balancing out the 31st Scoring defense. Detroit's defense has improved a little bit in the second half of the season, but they gave up at least 24 points in all of the Lions' first seven games, a stretch in which the team did go 1-6. The 2018 Rams were 20th in scoring defense, which is, you know, a little below average, but the difference between below average and terrible on defense will most certainly show up on a team's record. Unless, of course, you're the 2022 Minnesota Vikings. Now, being a better quarterback with a better set of skill players shouldn't be a fucking knock on the QB. A quarterback who plays the same or worse, no matter uh, who the weapons are around him, those are the QBs we should criticize. We love finding excuses for when quarterbacks like Jared Goff or Tua or even Kirk Cousins play well. But right now, the Lions do indeed have a bunch of very good skill players. And simply put, when they get into the red zone, they score touchdowns. To do that, you have to have a threatening run game. And like I said earlier, Detroit has one of the best red zone runners on earth in Jamal Williams. And you have to be a competent quarterback, which Goff certainly is. His 17 red zone passing touchdowns right now tied for second best with Joshie Allen and Joey Burrow. Oh yeah, and Trevor Lawrence. Of the top 20 quarterbacks, Goff also has the highest completion percentage in the red zone at 61.2. He's playing the best out of any QB when it matters the most. The Lions have a better red zone scoring percentage than any team in the league right now. Better than the Eagles, yes, the Chiefs, the Bengals. And uh, you don't think Jared Goff deserves real credit for that? Well, then I suggest you watch a Patriots game or a Texans game or a Broncos game and see what happens when your quarterback is not great in the red zone or when your skill players are not able to step up and be effective in the red zone, when everything just goes to shit in the red zone. For the Lions, not beating Goff is a good thing. For those other offenses, they're suffering from whiskey dick. No matter what they do, no matter how much they want to score, they just can't. My point, Jared Goff has never been a great QB, but he's been a good quarterback to a pretty dang good quarterback for stretches. The NFL is a very impatient league and this year more than any, it feels like Jared Goff understands the game as well as he ever has. This is his sixth full season as a starter, so he's benefited from being given that much time to really develop, something a lot of quarterbacks don't get. 
which is crazy considering he was traded away by the Rams to Detroit. The patience Detroit has shown to build their team via best player available in the last few drafts and commit to Goff while doing so is starting to click. An offensive coordinator, Ben Johnson, is doing a hell of a job as well. I think it's interesting to contrast Goff's renaissance season with the decline and eventual early exit of Matthew Stafford this year. Jared Goff was the third wheel in the budding romance between Stafford and McVeigh. The odd man out, if you will, and now he's ironically the one thriving when it was assumed he was going to be nothing more than a tank commander in Detroit. We all assumed the Lions would be drafting his replacement in the 2023 draft, but now I'm not so sure. Does anyone really know if the Lions would be better with CJ Stroud, Bryce Young, or Will Levi, Levis, Levis? I get that those guys have maybe more upside than a 28-year-old Jared Goff, but you're certainly taking a gamble when you've got a high-floor quarterback already under center. Goff's future may actually be controlled by another number one draft pick, Baker Mayfield, because the Lions have the Rams' first round pick. And right now, it's a top five pick, but maybe they won't be in a position to take a quarterback no matter what if Baker Mayfield plays well. And maybe, that's the best thing for the Lions and Jared Goff moving forward. Thanks for watching That's Good Sports. Please subscribe here on YouTube. We did another video like this about Tua. You might wanna check that out. Subscribe and check out the NFL Facts and Stats playlist I have here for quick shorts about NFL Facts and Stats. <laughs>